hey everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out to our very first master class. Uh, Charles here is uh, very generous enough to be able to, to offer up to be our, our first instructor. So um, Charles is uh, one of the owners um, of uh, Broken Cauldron uh, and uh, Broken Strings in specific, that side of the brewery. He's also the head brewer. Uh, Charles is the second and a half, or third generation uh, brewer in his family. So he's been doing it for quite a while. He's got pretty cool lineage that goes along with it. Uh, so tonight he's just going to talk to us about barrel aging. Uh, he's going to take us through a demonstration of moving a beer from a barrel into a bright tank for carbonation. And I'm uh, just going to kind of go over barrel aging in general. So without further ado, thank you. Charles. Thank you, Steve. Hey. Again, welcome. Some of you I met before. Some of you my first time, but good to meet you. Um, whenever you guys get a moment, you're done with the beer you're drinking or you want to try it, uh, that's the most recent beer that we've released that was a barrel aged beer from our side. It's a uh, it was a uh, bourbon barrel maker's mark that was used to age vanilla extract, and then we aged a 11% sweet stout in it that we served at our music festival we had last November. So we're down to a couple cases left of that. Uh, today we're emptying a stout that was brewed for the Ritz Carlton, their highball and harvest restaurant. Uh, this is a Knob Creek 10 year barrel. So it was aged 10 years Knob Creek, the Ritz Carlton highball and harvest picked out this barrel specifically. The, uh, the whiskey was, or bourbon was bottled specifically for them, single barrel bottle. So they served that in their restaurant and they had Knob Creek ship the, the barrel directly to me. Uh, we've been aging the beer since August 2nd. So it's been in there for September, October, November, December, January. About five months. Um, a lot of breweries will tend to age beers longer, up to a year. It all really depends on the climate you're storing the barrel in. We can get away with aging our beers a little faster because of the really warm climate. If you guys come and visit me in, in uh, July, uh, on a brew day, it gets to about 112 degrees back here, really yeah. humid. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we get a little more in and out of the barrel, and I'll go over that a little more in a bit. Uh, I'll go backwards real quick just to give you a brief little rundown of me. Um, I've been home brewing or I started as a home brewer in 2007. Uh, I learned from Ed Meesom uh, who's a professor at the Rosen College. Uh, there's a beer course there so if you're a student at UCF you can take a course that literally lets you drink and learn about beer. Uh, and then afterwards uh, we'd stay after class and we'd brew beer with the professor and uh, kind of started from there. Uh, and I had always known that my grandfather on my father's side um, was a master brewer in Puerto Rico. Uh, I have his uh, certificate uh, diploma from Brewing Academy in New York. Uh, he was a master brewer there for about 30 years in Puerto Rico before he passed away. And then his father was the head barrel cooper of a brewery in New Haven, Connecticut. He found that on his death certificate on Ancestry.com about two months ago. So technically third generation, it skips my, my father. He wasn't really interested in it, but uh, either way, I'm kind of trying to keep the name in the, in the brewing industry. Um, so home brewed forever, worked at Big River for a while, learned under Kent Wall, who went to open Crooked Can, who's now the head brewer at Orange County and uh, Brew Theory, which is a contract brewery open not far from here. And uh, just learned a lot, watched a lot of YouTube videos, read a lot of books, visited as many breweries as I possibly can and asked as many questions as I possibly can. We've been open for a little over two and a half years ago. We opened in June of 2016. Uh, we're a three barrel system, direct fire. Uh, use tankless water heaters, which makes my life so much easier. I don't have to have a hot liquor tank. Uh, this is the glycol unit right here. The drain goes over there, water filter. We have three fermenters and one three barrel bright tank. All temperature controlled with this fancy looking pipe system that took me a couple weeks to build almost falling off a ladder three times. <laughs> um, so into barrel aging. Uh, we've got a 10% stout, I believe, in here. It's been aging since August 2nd. Um, this was a Knob Creek barrel. Um, and the barrel aging process, what we're, at, what we're looking for is every time the, the barrel heats up or cools down, it's either expanding or contracting. So every time it does that, it's either sucking the liquid into the wood or it's pushing it back out. And that in and out of the wood is what lets us pull all these beautiful caramel, vanilla, oaky, tannin flavors out of the wood. And um, we just let it sit for about six months-ish. Um, um, 
we'll get into the process of getting it all empty here in a second, but do you guys have any questions about barrel aging or anything in particular? Yes. 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 We yeah. usually don't touch it for three months at least, maybe four sometimes, depending on the beer. I think I sampled this one uh, mid-December. And I was like, I think this is about ready. So we started on the label design and working with the Ritz when we were going to release it and stuff like that. Um, but what we use, the method I prefer to use, is called the Vinny Nail. Uh, if you ever, if you guys are familiar with Milk the Funk, there's a wiki page that they have. It's more for sour and wild beers, but barrel aging is something they focus on. So what the Vinny, Vinny Nail is, is we get uh, stainless steel nails that order on. One's a little bigger in case the first one doesn't work. I can have a bigger nail I can slam in the hole. So essentially I take a, I forget the exact drill bit size I use, but it's on Milk the Funk. If you type in Vinny Nail Milk the Funk, it'll come up on Google. So we drill a hole, sanitize it. Obviously I usually boil the drill bit and the screws for like 20 minutes. <coughs> to, and uh, drill a hole, pull the drill bit out really quick, have a glass there ready to go, and get a nice uh, couple ounce pour. And take the nail and bang it right back in. It's stainless, so you don't have to worry about rust, and it's sanitized and plugs the hole up real nicely. And then I can always take another reading from that same hole again. And usually we have a bigger nail on hand in case it doesn't want to seal right. We just have a bigger hip, uh, nail on there. So that's how we take samples. You could always use a thief, wine thief, or a whiskey thief. Those things with the hole or whatever, and pull it out the top. I prefer not to do that. Yeah, I mean, oxidation isn't as big of a problem with a big 10, 11% beer. If you actually want a little bit of oxidation, it helps smooth out the beer a little. It's not like a 4.2% lager that gets a little oxygen and it tastes like wet cardboard right away. It's a little more benefit. Like, you know, you want to get your whiskeys, your wines aerated when you drink them. So it doesn't hurt so much, but I just prefer not to do it. It's one extra way to maybe introduce something I don't want in the barrel. So yeah, I prefer just to do the vinny nail process, but uh, some people pull it right off the top. Either or. Yes, sir. Before you put the beer in there, do you sanitize it? Yes, thank you. I probably, did, I probably could have had a more, but questions yeah. are great. So I probably didn't prepare myself with like, whatever. I didn't have, I didn't have a lesson plan for you guys. <laughs> We're shooting off the hip here. Anyway, yes, couple things. Um, steaming is something we do. I get uh, like a wallpaper steamer, fill it with some distilled water, put it right in there, wrap it with a towel, let it sit for about 20, 30 minutes, maybe a little longer. Usually the barrel gets real nice and warm and that steam does two things. It helps swell the wood back up so when I do fill it, uh, I have less chance of a leak and it also helps one last kind of little bit of sanitation, it sterilize. Well, it's really hard to truly sterilize a barrel because there's always the chance some sort of thing is going to end up still living in the wood. It's deep in the wood, but... Well, one yeah. more thing. The club passes around a, a smaller barrel that sometimes has sours in it, sometimes has other things in it. What do you recommend on that? Once the barrel's gone sour, you're pretty much stuck there. You're sour, right? Yeah, yeah, you'd have to really do a completely, like... There's other methods of sanitizing barrels. You can put sulfur sticks in there and burn sulfur, and then there's gas. Sulfur gas literally permeates the barrel. And that kills off things, but then there's a potential of having sulfur residue in the barrel. Um, there's uh, ozone. You could ozone treat the barrel. There's really nothing, though, that's going to 100% sterilize the wood. Because it's deep in the wood that those critters are still going to live. No matter what you do, they're still so. And long term, if, if you've had something that's had bread, or lacto, or petio in it, no matter what you do to sterilize it, you try to put a clean bear in there more than likely long enough, it's gonna start showing effects from those bugs. So if it's sour, it's once it's, but once it's got bugs, you can't go back. Yeah, so you should take it off six months no matter what? No, 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 six months is just what I tend to do. Some beers are have been longer than that. Uh -huh. Six bucks, six months I found has been a good sweet spot for us, just with having this open air and more temperature back and forth. And say if this was held in an air conditioned tap room, like some breweries do. So I'm getting a little faster of an age, I think, um, for my tastings and what I've done. Um, but six months is just what I do. Some breweries go eight months to a year. Hunapu is usually a year. Never had that. Hunapu? 
Yeah, through silence it leads to years. Yeah. Uh, what was the first thing you barrel aged and how did it turn out? Uh, the first thing we barrel aged? Or maybe not necessarily the, you as a home brewer. I didn't barrel age at home. I didn't start barrel aging until we got here. Uh, we bought a couple Jack Daniels barrel and I brewed an imperial version of liquid vinyl at 10%. Yeah, Steve was talking about that. And it was a very fresh Jack Daniels barrel, so it only spent about four months in the barrel. And uh, emptied the barrel, dry hopped it in the bright tank, let it sit for a few days, carbonate, and settle out, and we bottled that up. And I thought it came out pretty darn good. <laughs> yeah. It was very easy to finish by myself. Yeah. <laughs> we will. Yeah, I've got some more plans for some more beers, and that's another one we want to do again. We want to do My Fermentable Romance again, which was a bourbon cider barrel-aged uh, quad, which came out really good. And then I've gotten a lot of requests for straight out of Paramore, which was a eight-year Woodford Reserve barrel that had a sweet stout that we treated with chocolate and oranges. Ooh. Yeah. Nice. I like oranges and chocolate. It was really good. Yes, sir. Yes, we will start doing that here soon at some point. I want to do some gozas and some barrels. I'd love to do like get some tequila barrels and do some gozas in those. Um, and maybe set aside a few barrels and add some bugs to them and just not touch those barrels for at least a year. See what comes, some wild ales and stuff like that. Yeah, so we will be doing some wild barrel aged beer soon. Right now we just basically do clean ones. Yes, Steve. Does, uh no, as once it's in the barrel, it's fine. I'm not worried about it leaving the barrel and getting into a fermenter. But I would be concerned once I'm done with it in the barrel, what I would do. At that point, we'd probably have a dedicated bright tank just for bug beers, for those type of beers that we want to barrel to come out of funk because I wouldn't want to use. It is conceivable to completely sterilize that from a bug beer to a clean beer, but I'd take that chance. There's some breweries that do it. I know uh, Ard Wolf does it up in Jacksonville. They use their system for clean and wild, but I would probably get a separate bright tank just for the wild beers. And then obviously packaging, we would probably want to do separate or just do have their own kegs or whatever. That makes sense. But in the barrel, I'm not worried about it. Cool. Yes, sir. I have, I have a barrel. Yes. Probably dried out. You want to rehydrate it. I did that. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you probably just didn't soak it long enough. Yeah, like he said, then then the bucket. Yeah, because then it's completely surrounded everywhere. Yes. Is the syrup considered no good now that you have a nail in it? You know what I mean? No, you can just keep putting bigger, bigger nails. It's, it's just a piece of stainless steel, so it's it's inert. It's been sterilized. I could just clean it again and re if I wanted to reuse this barrel. The Ritz Carlton wants it back for display purposes to use for like serving things and big banquets and stuff. So they're getting it back after this. I'll probably just hammer the nail all the way down um, so there's not a hole. But you could theoretically reuse it. There's nothing leaking out of it right now. There's no reason that it would start down the road as long as the barrel stays hydrated. That's the nice thing about wood is it almost heals itself. Kind of, yeah. Yes. What's the main uses that you can get out of a barrel before it? I'm guessing there's a point that you can't use the barrel. Every barrel is different. Okay. And at that point, you may want to be using the barrel for a different thing, not the full barrel qualities, but to use it as like a solera. Solera? Solera. That's like where you would keep like a, uh, a mother of a, a mother of a sour. Gotcha, gotcha. You owe it and you, you can drain from it to keep like to inoculate other batches or to or, or mix or blend with other batches, and then you would feed it again with fresh beer to top it off again. So you could use it as a Solera. 
Yeah. Like a voter? Voters aren't always necessarily, voters don't technically, weren't previously used for bourbon. Sometimes they're made just for the beer. So once it's been kind of stripped of its bourbon qualities, you could use it for other things like, like you know, like a voter or Solera. Or you could turn it into a nice cabinet or nice stand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, or you sell it. We sell them sometimes. People yeah, like it. Before it would go sour. Yeah, like uh, I mean, the, the, as the, long the, as you kept putting clean beer store, is there like a it risk? May, it may never go sour. Okay. If you're keeping it sanitized and there was no bugs in the wood to begin with, yeah, it may never. Cool. You know, it might not until you were to inoculate it with something. But if you were to properly sanitize it after each beer, sterilize it with some steam, yeah, and there wasn't pre-existing bugs in the wood to begin with, you may not have a problem. <coughs> You mainly only see the bugs so much from what I'm told in wine barrels as opposed to the whiskey barrels and stuff because the higher ABV, the higher proof, yeah. the better at sanitizing or sterilizing the barrel than the wine, which is at a much lower proof. Yes? We'll go for him first. Okay. First oh, question. Um, have you ever tried smaller uh, barrels and seeing if, if you could take Age it uh, faster? Okay. No, I have not. Okay. And I have a reason for it. Um, I've heard it from several other people, and then I also heard it when I went. I was in Chicago for two weeks uh, for the Siebel program, and I went to Goose Island and I did a behind the scenes barrel aging tour of the barrel house and private tasting and everything. One of the things the, um, the tour guide told us is there's a reason this became the, the industry kind of size for barrels. It's like the sweet spot with the proper amount of surface to liquid ratio, surface area ratio. Do I've been told smaller barrels, there's more chance at oxidation, quicker um, evaporation, not enough surface area for the liquid or too much surface area for the liquid. Right. So here it only, it just makes sense. I can get these barrels from brokers the size of the barrel, the equipment, it just makes sense to do 53 gallon barrel. A five or 10 would, you know, unless I was gonna pull five or 10 gallons off of the thing. Yeah. But I, the, over centuries, this, is, this was the sweet spot for beer, or, or for mainly spirits, of the size barrel that works the best for the final outcome of the product. Okay, that's cool. One more question. Yes. Speaking of barrels, you know, it's like a three barrel system. Is that 32 gallons per barrel? In, or 50 gallons? In the beer world, it's 32 gallons. Or yeah. 31 gallons is a barrel. In the whiskey world, the barrel is 53 gallons. Okay. And then wine barrels are usually bigger than this. <coughs> There's 60, I think. Maybe more. So, in the beer world, a barrel measurement is 31 gallons. Whiskey, a barrel is used. This size barrel is 53. Why that happened, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you actually want some ingress of oxygen. That's that part of the barrel, part of the process, or part of the one of the things the barrel can do provide that a steel tank would. Sorry, sorry. You're good. Go ahead. Like I've heard aspects of like in certain high gravity beers, they want like a sherry like without having it. That how you introduce that sherry like taste into a beer by. That I don't know. I'm not a sherry drinker. <laughs> it's like an oxidative it's a flavor. Oxidated? Yeah, it's possible. Some sherry, yeah. Actually. yeah, well, I mean, like when you, you pour it. a nice bottle of wine, you, you pour it into so an aerator. Well, an aerator or what, what do they call it? A decanter. Okay. The decanting process is to, to give that liquid some, <coughs> some oxygen first, yeah. and it helps smooth it out. So, you know, so that's kind of what you're doing with a higher ABV beer. Giving it a little oxygen over time, it helps smooth that beer out. Oxygen in this case is somewhat okay. Like I said, a 4.2% lager, you don't want that to see any oxygen. Yeah. Or it's gonna be wet cardboard and green apples really quick. That's why you don't see a Bud Light barrel aged beer. And even the one they did was like at 8%, I think. I didn't know they did one. They did one with Jim Beam, I think. It's still on yeah. the shelves. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I forgot to go back. Yeah. You, 
could. You could. If you wanted to. At home, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Technically, we can't. Oh, we are theoretically allowed to do that here. Adding liquor back to beer is considered fortifying, well, which the, theoretically to the ABT, that's what I would be doing. Some of us do that. If I get a beer, if I get a barrel that gets shipped to me and it's a little drier than I would have liked, most of the time when you open these barrels up, there's a little puddle of whiskey still bourbon left in them. They're still wet. Sometimes. <laughs> run it through. Like it's usually got a bunch of black stuff in it from the char. Yeah. You usually run it through a coffee filter, but it tastes fine. <laughs> um, but uh, you can do it at home if you wanted to, to kind of reintroduce that bourbon. But it, it might be a little stronger than, than what it normally would have been. You're going to want that barrel to, to reseal with water first before you go waste the bourbon on it. Let it hold and then maybe try re-soaking it with some bourbon. Sure. Anyone else? Yes, sir. So say you finish the barrel, they love what you did. Some breweries will just dump the beer right back in. Okay. I've heard of that happening. I haven't used the barrel twice yet. Okay. Usually when I'm done with the barrel, um, either someone's already claimed it mm -hmm. or I, I've sold it online or on Facebook, I'll throw a post up. Because we just haven't gotten to that point where we're ready to start doing maybe second generation barrels or, or clunky stuff yet. Right. Um, but yeah, you could theoretically, if it's, Maybe if it's a stout and a stout, they both had the same kind of yeast, sure. Okay. You know, but so you could rinse them out using hot water. You could steam them again if you want to kind of maybe give them a quick pasteurization, if you will. You wouldn't use any, like, I'm sorry, like acid? I wouldn't use caustic or acid or anything like that. No, you're not going to want to CIP the barrel, I don't think. No. Because then you're going to start stripping things and you can leave those chemicals behind okay. and still soak into the wood. Can't rinse them away like you can in the steel pan. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So kind of piggybacking off Tim. None of that. No so more. Like after after you clean out the barrel, you use it once. You uh, you drain out the barrel, and then I want to clean it again for reuse. Like that whiskey barrel again. Um, should I whiskey or beer? Uh, so either or. Work. It, like use the barrel as. Kind I know of that beer. there's like there are distilleries that have taken beer barrels back and have aged beer or whiskey back in. in so it was a bourbon, then it was beer, and then it was used for Jameson yeah, stuff. I want to use it for beer, but I want to refresh it with bourbon again. Like sure. This. So like when I when I empty it out the first time, and then I need to clean it, right? And like if I'm cleaning out a normal secondary, there's usually yeast at the bottom, so I want to wash that out, right? So I'm doing that with hot water. Sure. I dump it out. Is that enough for then I just you know put some bourbon in there and let it sit? Is it now clean enough for me to put another beer in there? Is there some extra steps? Up? Should I wash it? Should I wash it out? Of Bourbon should do a good job of cleaning everything off, but okay. it's up to you. Yeah. You're taking a risk anytime you put beer in a barrel. Got it. Has it ever worked with uh, maple syrup? Steaming beers? may help. Steaming can help. Like on a five, like you said, you use a wallpaper steamer. Yeah. Can't like will that still fit through like the? It that's, just that's a larger hole than Artificially so agent? Right. I don't know. Maybe. I've seen that once. There's a whiskey company. I think it's in Carolina. They actually hyper age their uh, bourbon. I like that. I don't know. It's yeah. There's 
new ways of doing things, but <laughs> that's the old school way. Just let it sit and do its thing. I mean, you're, you're more than welcome to try. Well, it's like a full report. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Is there any benefit of a barrel over just trying like oak chips or spirals? The oak chips and spirals weren't used to age whiskey. They didn't have yeah. the neutral spirit put in it eight years ago and have whatever goes on over that. The, all those little chemical processes and, yeah. and, and, and interactions occur. That didn't happen to an oak spiral. It didn't happen to wood chips. So yeah, you'll get like white oak highlight. It's just white oak chips. You get a different flavor profile than you would if it was a white oak barrel that had a, 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 a spirit in it. You know what I mean? Because the spirit is a, it's a, it's just, I can't think of a scientific word, but it, it, it dissolves stuff. It's, it's, it's doing that process. It's, it's a solvent. So that solvent's needed to develop all those flavors in the barrel along with the char. You don't have char on wood chips or spirals. So you can get flavors from those, but you're getting different flavors. So it's all what you want that final outcome to be. If you want, if it tastes more like bourbon with the vanilla and all those nice flavors, then I would suggest using a barrel that was used to age bourbon. But if you're just trying to get some white oak or some cedar flavor into a beer, throw some spirals in. Yeah, because like there's this product they have now, they're called squirrels. It's all at a convention. It's like this stainless steel box, and you can put wood slats in the box around it. So you creating basically like an artificial barrel in a way, but it's still touching wood. But that wood never aged Maker's Mark for, for, for three years or, or Knob Creek for 10 years. So it's not the same as getting you know, a barrel that sat in a warehouse, one of the big buildings in Kentucky for eight years and did its thing. Like it's just not the same. Yeah, there's a lot of magic that happens in those barrel houses. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's different. You know, it just all depends what your final, what you want the final product to be. Do you want white oak highlight or do you want the uh, honey proof? If you're, you know, comparing cigar city beers. Okay. Beer for sale right now. Which beer? We just tasted. Yeah. Yeah, we have that beer in the tasting room. Nice. It's very good. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, we did that beer for our music. We had it 11 bands on November 11th. 11 11. <laughs> so it was pretty cool. And um, obviously, Broken Strings is my brewery's brand, and we're always just trying to work with musicians and bands and just do music themed stuff. So everything gets a music themed name. Very cool. Yeah. How long did that beer take to Oh, that beer I think was about six months, too. Okay. Yeah. I had the barrel, and we started playing the festival, and I was like, well, let's do a barrel beer for it. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so this is a bulldog. Uh, basically, it's a racking cane built for barrel. Uh, we can adjust the length of this to make it go farther down if it was a bigger barrel. And we could theoretically make it smaller if we wanted to by just unscrewing this and moving it down if it was a smaller barrel. Um, right here is just a nice little valve to close off. We put CO2 here to come out of the top here to push the liquid down and in the tube, come out again. Um, it's a little, you could change the pressure like you would on a, um, counter pressure filler. So if you wanted the pressure to stay at 10 and you dialed it in, it would gas off if it went over 10 in a way. Um, stopper that fits in the bung kind of helps create a seal. And then the last little thing here is there's a nail at the bottom. And you can make that longer if you want. And that just helps you stay above and leave some of those leaves, that yeast behind in the barrel and not get it into the bright tank or oak chips too. Sometimes there's still a lot of, a lot of the, the chips fall off over time. They flake off, and they settle on the bottom. There, there are homebrew versions of these, probably the Bulldog. I know one, any, anyone who wants to borrow it, call me. What's it called? 
Like a bulldog. We call them bulldogs. Okay. Rack and cane, wine rack and cane, depends what company's selling it. Um, Nope the Funk has, um, you can build your own by buying parts, random parts. We got this from, uh, I think, More Beer. Um, when you get a brewer's license, you can set up a, um, a commercial account with them and get special brewer pricing. So it was a little better price than just buying it normal. And we just put a nice uh, stainless quick disconnect here for the CO2 connection and pretty much it. So take this right here and basically by s screwing that down, it starts flattening this um, rubber flange or stopper almost. And um, the more you squeeze it down, the more bunched it up in uh, the wider it'll be and it'll start kind of expanding in the hole to keep it there. But just to be safe, I usually wrap it extra with some straps to keep it down because it's obviously, there's nothing real else other than that out pressure to keep this from popping out again because <coughs> uh, we're usually using about 10 PSI to push this liquid out of the barrel into the bright tank. That was pretty good the heck out of you too. Had that happen? No, no. I, from the very first time I strapped it down, I wouldn't take any chances. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm not losing this beer. Obviously, I've been letting this soak in the big sink back there in a sanitizer, so it's been fully clean. It's ready to go. Take the bottom off. Put it right down the middle. Push it down nice and hard as best you can. tank earlier, uh, purged it really well with CO2, so that should be as close to a 100% CO2 environment as possible. Um, and I left it pressurized at just over, uh, at about 3 PSI. You want a little back pressure, keeps it from shooting in there too fast. Also in the tank, we have a stand pipe. So at the bottom, everything comes out of the very bottom. We have a little pipe that comes up about 3 inches from the bottom of that dome so we can leave behind any yeast or sediments that'll settle in the tank and not go into kegs or bottles. So it's just like a racking cane, but instead, a racking arm, but instead it comes from right up the top. We call it a standpipe. So I'm just going to connect this right here so I have a sight glass so I can see what I'm doing. Some brewers uh, will put a valve right here, but I have one down at the bottom going into this tank so I don't need one as bad. This baby up. doing this, does anyone have any other questions? In this beer, no. Have we put any sort of thing like cocoa nibs or anything yeah. in them? Yeah. Yeah, well, and for cocoa, I usually use a product called Chalaca, which is a liquid cocoa nib um, that's been pasteurized. Uh, cocoa nibs themselves aren't sterile. There is a possibility that there are bugs still living on the nibs. So this is a liquid cocoa product. I know Graciani's seen it before, maybe Steve. 
um, that's just come out maybe in the past two years, and it's a, a liquefied cocoa. It literally smells like a Hershey chocolate bar, but it's not sweetened. So it's liquid cocoa nibs. We've done. You, I've used that. I was curious about the quality of the like. I haven't had that issue. I'll usually put it in a bag, in a hot bag, put it in and fill it. Have you ever worked with uh, barrels that have aged maple syrup in them? Yeah, that was Mr. Brunch side. I didn't get as much maple syrup flavor as I wanted. I like this Brunch side. I tightened it a little more than I wanted to. I wasn't paying attention. outside it's still in the 60s in here oh, so I was also <laughs> with the, the glycol <laughs> machine running with self creates heat the lights I mean they're all LED but I've never had to worry about it getting so cold in here that the tanks need to be kept warm right. yeah, it could be freezing out I mean it's cold outside right now and we're still I'm pretty comfortable about you guys and all moving around and stuff Especially if you have fermentation going too, because that's going to throw off heat. Oh, that's, that's true. Yep. I don't know if it would be enough to counteract it 10 below uh, night, but. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if my house got really cool, uh, if I needed to worry about heating my. So, anyway, I've got my CO2 connected. Uh, I've got to close down. I'm just going to make sure at the valve, at the gauge, that it's at the right push. Vowels, one on each side of the connection here. Go ahead and open here. I can hear it building up pressure. From here, all I'm really going to do is I'm just slowly open my bottom valve that goes in this right tank. You can see it start showing up top there. So She's slowly moving through there now, and um, see it's starting to fill in the uh, sight glass here. So what I'll do is, is I, it's about three psi, but as that barrel starts pushing in, the tank pressure is going to increase. So I'm just going to slowly let it gas off, and that'll let the pressure stay the same to where the beer will move from here over into here. And that's basically it. It takes about uh, yeah, about 30 minutes maybe or so to fully empty it out. You don't want to go too fast because you don't want too much cavitation or anything like that. Disrupt uh, the sediment down there. But uh, basically that's it. So you're about 10 PSI right now? Yep, the, uh, I'm at 10 PSI. Um, it's uh, holding it just below three pre positive pressure in the tank it's being pushed with about 10. So that change is enough to allow it to flow. Yeah, but it's a controlled flow. It, the back pressure keeps it from wanting to just rush right in. Yeah? How long does the right take to take the Um, You can get it done in less than a day if you really wanted to push it and try hard. You can set it up real high here through the carb stone and just let it degas like this. So there's a carb stone in it? There's an eight inch carb stone in there. So what do you, how long do you recommend? Well, the bright tank's doing two things. It's carbonating the beer, and it's brightening, brightening the beer by letting the solids fall out of it one last time. Um, I'm not planning on bottling this beer until Tuesday. So it's going to stay in this tank until Tuesday. We'll bottle and keg right from it that night. So once it's full, or once it's full, you set it at a certain pressure to carbonate until Tuesday, and you have a certain uh, pressure Keep to an eye on gauge. Keep it to go yeah, yeah, you can use your, your Hans something. I want to say Hans Zimmer, but that's definitely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the Nagel, something chart, 
There's a chart, CO2 chart, where you can check the temperature that the beer is being held at and the pressure that you're putting the beer under. And then you find out which CO2, the, the, the level of CO2 concentration you want. Like for a stout like this, we're going to be at like 2.2, 2.3. With an IPA, 2.7. Saison 3.2, 3.5. So, so it's really like exactly the same number, it's just about checking all the Essentially, the scale doesn't change any of it. So it's still, like it's it's still a, pressure, but you have a much larger volume of beer. Yeah, right? I also have an eight inch. Yeah, I'm, I'm not right. trying to like that compare makes, it. That makes sense. <laughs> your cart your cart your cart stone's like that bit, right? And mine's like that round and it's eight inches long. So it makes up for it. Plus I have seven hundred and fifty pounds worth of CO2 yeah. I to put it. So Yeah. We have I mean I can't show it to you now because it's in the tank. But, but <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't supposed to be. It. It's just it's it's literally it, it's it's about the biggest carb stone you can you can you can buy a bigger one, but, but for this but size, like me putting it at 25 psi, the same as like me putting it at 25 psi all for like two days. Yes and no. Okay. You are you just talking about a corny keg? Yes. Corny keg's just bringing CO2 through the dip tube. If you put it in through the gas outlet, which is the best way to do it, connect the gas to a black corny cap. Um, then it's just dripping in from the dip tube. Still big bubbles. I've got an eight inch carb stone that's putting them into very, very tiny bubbles so it can it dissolves right away. Okay. Yeah, it's the difference between like forcing into solution, but then- yeah, The only way you'd be able to get it, do it as fast is you'd have to shake it. And then that forceful shaking is forcing it into the liquid. What temperature do you keep it at? 34. I turned the glycol system off right now, but usually it's kept at about 34 degrees. I could go lower, but I've had problems with it freezing over, even though I put a shit ton of glycol in there. So glycol is supposed to keep the liquid from freezing. Um, sometimes, for some reason, it's not. So I usually let it run at 34, but that's about the coldest I ever need the beer to be anyway. We store it in the in the in the uh, cooler at 38 to serve. So yeah. 34 just to give it a nice cold temperature to help condition it and drop anything out. Yeah, the lager sometimes I go to 32. The colder the better when it comes to. Uh, yeah, 34 is pretty 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 good. Yeah. Any colder you get ice. Well, that ice. Well, ice could you know if it's a low ABV beer. If I try doing. Um, my lager, if I tried cold crashing it to 30, it would, it would freeze up, possibly. Put a Bud Light in the freezer, it'll, it'll freeze. <laughs> that cold crash in our fermenter is too much. You get a nice little layer of ice as the tank and test it. So yeah, as you can see, the bubbling there is letting me know that this is pushing through, forcing the gas out, replacing the gas with liquid, and I'm slowly lowering. Just keep an eye on this. I'll, when it starts just dropping down, you know, close the valve. She's done emptying. Should get about 50, 49 to 50 gallons into the tank. You fill pretty much to the brim, um, but you obviously lose some through evaporation and absorption. So this and I leave a little behind. I leave a little behind. It doesn't look like a little bubble there. Where? Oh, right screen. here? Yeah. yeah, it's just bubbling out a little. That's why I say sometimes this stopper doesn't make the best yeah. seal, so I just hold it down a little extra. So you see but it's you still enough that's pushing in there where it's pushing the liquid out. It's just a little. You see, you get 40 to 50 gallons into the right tank. How many gallons do you think it's going to get out of the right tank? I'll usually leave three behind because of the standpipe. So like the standpipe leaves six, four, three six, gallons six. below it. That's usually full with sediment. Right. So it's one last way of leaving everything behind before it goes to the keg or the bottle. I don't filter, so it's my best way of, of doing that. Um, sometimes clear firm or something like that. Cold crash, I mean, cold crashing works really well if you just give it the time, the right vessel. Yes, sir. So when you were doing the can base for the right tank and trying to purge it all out with the CO2, is there, how can you tell when all the liquid has been purged and sanitized right before it's transferred? How can you tell if there's no more oxygen left in the tank and it's just CO2? Yeah, yeah. I don't have the technology to do that. I'd have to have a DO meter, okay. dissolved oxygen meter, or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that CO2 sinks heavier than oxygen. Okay. 
So what I usually do is, is I'm filling the CO2 from the side here through the car, I'm just going to low in the tank. I will gas out through this tube, which is coming from the very top. So if, I, if I'm running CO2 continuously through this tank for 20 minutes and it's gassing out through this top tube, then within about 20 minutes, there's not much oxygen left in the tank. And if there is, it's very little. I got you. But without having the science fancy expensive equipment, there's no way for me to, for me to physically tell. Okay. There, there's ways to do it, I just don't have that equipment. But I just purge as much CO2 through that tank. I'll let it run for 20, 30 minutes sometimes. Maybe, you know, longer the better. Yeah. Um, yes. 30, 40 degrees? 30, 40 degrees is what I keep the brake tank on. Uh, how many PSI? Every beer is different. So <coughs> or stout? So this stout, I'll probably put it under 10 PSI for four days. Four days? Until, until Tuesday. If I wanted to carve it quicker, I'd put it higher. Just keep an eye on the gauge. The only way to truly tell if your carbonation is get a Zondagel, which I know that's right. And <laughs> basically, it's this weird device that has this cylinder in it with a gauge and two handles on it. You connect it to the bright tank and you pull a sample of liquid into this canister and you shake the hell out of it. And it, that makes the gas leave the liquid and it, the pressure on the gauge goes up. And you can tell by how much pressure the gauge goes up, how much CO2 you have dissolved in the liquid. That's the way most of the bigger breweries, but it's like a $2,000 piece of equipment. Just have a little trigger on it. Yeah. <laughs> Mine, I, I just <coughs> take samples and trust that the temperature and pressure are hitting me to where I need to be. Yeah, I heard it works like crap. It breaks really easily. So it's like spend $700 and it break in a month or two and not give me a true reading or drop two grand on the real one. Or the next thing is if you have a fancy computer thing that you just put the liquid in and it tells you the CO2, the alcohol content, the bitterness, all in one reading. Brewhub has one of those. Ask them to take in the lab. They've got all that fancy equipment. But that shit's not, not cheap. GW Kent makes the cheaper one you're talking about, but it's, it's acrylic. It's, a, it's like a plastic. They break really easily, I'm told. I'd rather just wait and get the more expensive one that I know it, I could drop it and it'll survive. <laughs> cool. Yes, sir? So when you allow the barrel to age during the summer months, that's the heat, so it's actually expanding the wood, so it ferments? Well, it's, it's, it's expanding during the day from the heat of the day. Mm -hmm. It's contracting at night from the, the cooling off at night. So that constant in and out, the in and out of the wood, the age. expansion and contraction of the wood. It's like a sponge. It's, every time it so expands, it's, it's soaking up liquid. Tank. Every time it shrinks, it's, it's just pushing it out. And that in and out, every time the liquid goes in and out, it's bringing something back with it. Okay, now I see why you want that more so in a simple controlled environment. Yeah, if you go. Kentucky and do a, a whiskey barrel, bourbon barrel tour. The barrels at the top of the warehouse age faster than the bottle than the barrels at the bottom. Huh. So it's warmer up there. There's more temperature change up there. So those barrels they know will will mature faster. So they'll rotate. They'll take barrels from the top and bring them down to the bottom, and vice versa. You get equal aging of the barrels. So people that do that for a living. <laughs> they, they're usually big dudes. I can imagine. Anything else, guys? <coughs> You're going to keep around. one keg of this, right? Um, we're going to keg off a couple. The rest is going in the bottle. We're keeping some, and the rest is going to the Ritz Carlton. It's going to be their signature beer. That they're going to be able to serve for like dessert and stuff. We're using. Uh, Treat it with, uh, we will treat it with, I'm going to add beans directly to the bright tank in, in it the day before I bottle it, uh, lineage roasting beans. They do the house blend for the Ritz, so we're taking that house blend of coffee and treating the beer with it. Ooh. Pardon? Probably just one day on the coffee for me.
Yes, sir. No. How much do you lose over the course of the six months to Angel Share, or is that even a thing of beer? Oh, it, there's you lose you lose it through absorption and evaporation. Okay. Every, uh, it just depends. Every beer is different. At least a gallon or two. It's not bad. Six months. Yeah. yeah. I'm talking 50 yeah. gallons. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could lose 20 to 30 percent in a whiskey that sat there for 10 plus years. We're not losing a lot compared to them. But 100 something proof spirit's going to evaporate a little more readily than a, than a stout or, or any beer for that matter. Yeah, it's not as thick or viscous yes. as, a, as a stout, so it Yeah, but well, we do lose some through the evap. The angel, sh angel does get her, her small share. <laughs> Yeah. So the aspect of a lot of the adjuncts that are used in the beer, the barrel aging, that's not added in the barrel. That's Sometimes you do. Like if I was treating this beer with vanilla beans, I would have added the vanilla beans months ago. Okay, right you would into the barrel. Right into the barrel. Yeah. I want a nice fresh coffee aroma in this beer, so I'm doing it now as opposed to months ago, which is where it would have fallen off. Cocoa, I would do at the very beginning, give it a lot of time to rest on it. Every, it just depends. It just, uh, it's, it's, there is yeah. no set method. It's just an aspect of it. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't adding the cocoa too early produce bitterness? It could. I guess, depending on what you're using. I don't think you get much bitterness <coughs> in Chilaca. Oh. Like straight out of Paramore, it aged on Chilaca for the entire time. It was in the barrel. But then, then that was aging. You can rinse it out. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Do you adjust your APP when you barrel age, and do you how do you adjust it? Like, what do you mean? Like some of the residual quality whiskey or anything. Can you pick up ABV from the yeah. bourbon yeah. that's in the barrel? Yes, yeah. you can. Do you adjust your readings really. for that, or are you just like, eh, it's barrel age? It's yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah, we're not really like, so like for example, Oscar Blues Pale Ale, it says 5.5% ABV on that can, right? Maybe, and that's my guess. Yeah. The federal government will randomly grab samples of that beer and test it. And if it's, certain, if it's at a certain point above or below that ABV, they'll get fined for not having the correct alcohol content on their bottle. Being that we sell most of this ourselves, or at a, and it's not going across state lines, so the feds don't want anything to do, don't have anything to do with it. Yeah. We don't have that issue to worry about. So I mainly just go with what my hydrometer readings tell me the ABV was, because guessing how much I really pulled, it would be a guess. Yeah. So I go by my my hydro readings. So when you're going into the barrel, though, the fermentation is long over the top. Yeah. It's just Pretty much, usually I, have, I haven't seen much secondary fermentation. I do have some off-gassing. You will, the barrel will off-gas a little because of CO2 left in the beer from fermentation. But I haven't had much of secondary fermentation in the barrels, but it is possible. So I mean, theoretically though, you can take a hydrometer reading of it before you put it in the barrel and when you take it out, there's not much fermentation. I guess you could. You won't see much of a difference. Right? Possibly, yeah. Yes, sir. You were having a full fermentation in the barrel? I have not. Have you heard any? It's possible. I know people, I know some places do it. It's usually the wild stuff they usually do that with. But I haven't done it yet. We usually ferment in the tanks, mainly because we want to keep that fermentation temperature controlled. I can't, unless I put that in a room, I can't really control it. Unless he's designing me that pipe system. <laughs> So no, I haven't done that, but it, I know that some breweries do. Have you ever used smaller barrels? I have not, no. Oh, yeah? I've just used this size. Did you just get here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Went over a little bit. So I did some research. I also found out when I did a tour of Goose Island that there's a reason this is the size of barrel over centuries. This is the, this is the sweet spot, if you will, yeah. for surface contact, all that good stuff. Smaller barrels aren't quite good, best, be, aren't the best for that. Yeah, I'm asking because I have a couple barrels, or a couple beers are about to go in a barrel, so a 15 gallon barrel and a four gallon barrel. You know, asking about like uh, waxing the barrels to like try to simulate the same size of that basically to get the oil and ingress at about the same level. 
waxing would stop. You don't usually see barrels get waxed because that'll s create an ox, like almost yeah. seals the barrel, not letting anything in or out. Okay. You want the barrel to breathe. Yeah, and, well, with a size like that, because the, uh, the contact there is. But from what I read, because it's smaller the, ones? Yeah, so the Maybe. smaller barrels are going to way more, like a uh, larger percentage of the beer is contacting the surface, you get way more ingress and for a way shorter period of time. Possibly, yeah. So. That may be a way to, to, uh, to control that. Because the wax does prevent, helps stop that ingress or egress, either or. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a barrier. Um, I used to tear my number one, but I think I might have done it the wrong way. It felt like a can of wax. Yeah, you want beeswax, I think, is the yeah. is one of the more preferred natural wax. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Sounds like a good uh, excuse for an experiment. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Go, man. <laughs> No, no, they're only getting bottled. Okay, so, so, so it's not gonna be We're going to bottle it up. I have a label designed. I had bottle caps made. This, are you going to do this again for them? Or this not in this barrel, but in the future we may do it again. Possibly this is the first time we've done it with them. Awesome, that's great. Yeah, they've had liquid vinyl on tap for uh, since we've opened. Oh, so this is liquid vinyl. Mm. Barrel. No, oh, they they've been it. kind enough to have liquid vinyl, my black IPA, yeah. on tap for over for just, almost two years, a little over two years now. Yeah. This was just something else we worked on. They worked with Knob Creek. They got this barrel bottled up specifically for them. Which Ritz Carlton is this? The one here in Orlando on John Young, the Grand Lakes property. Yeah. There's a restaurant there called Highball and Harvest, which is really good. Um, um, we didn't really get, we, we called it, uh, so in order to maybe do more, so they wanted a cassette tape for their label. So we call it Mixtape Volume 1. Nice. So the next time we do the beer, we'll call it Mixtape Volume 2, Mixtape Volume 3, so we don't have to create a new label each time. <laughs> um, so it doesn't really have a name. It's Highball and Harvest Mixtape Volume 1. So it still has a music theme to it, but we let them kind of run with it. They wanted a mixtape, so that's what we did. When do you think of it? Next Friday, I think. A bottle it Tuesday. Keg it Tuesday. We'll probably make them a little vent and tap it on Friday. They probably won't have it till the following week. I'm pretty sure I've got a couple, but you guys, if someone's really interested, we use that thing right there. Just have to clean and sanitize it first. It's Hidden Springs built that for me. The head brewer there is a, a metal guy. So he fabricated that out of us. It's basically four counter pressure fillers on a rack, an adjustable rack on hinges. We're usually able to knock out uh, a little over 200 bottles, set up and clean up, break down in about three hours. You turn right out of the bright tank with that, right? We go right in from the bright tank right into that filler. So we usually keg what we want to keg first and then bottle off the rest. that screw that's holding on that's maybe pulling me up about a half inch above the wood there'll be a little left but like I said that's all the stuff that's settled because there's still yeast that settles in the, in the barrels that makes its way from the I cold crash as long as possible still some still settles again in there so you got ditched out there and you're like three inches here in the tank yeah here. that's all you're doing to help clarify what you get into yeah well, I left some behind in the fermenter. I'm leaving some behind here, and I'll leave the last of it behind there. We use uh, most most of the time on our stouts of the beers that we're trying to bottle. At least we use an English ale yeast, which tends to flocculate much more. Liquid vinyl had 
some bottles ended up getting a little sediment because we used Chico and that didn't uh, flocculate as much. So a little bit did end up in some of those bottles. Ain't gonna hurt your old B12. Good for the hangover. So it only it stopped flowing there because the pressure got too high here to where it wasn't able to push to overcome that. So I'm just letting it gas a little more so it's back down to where it was. It got away from me. Um, but she's emptying again. Yeah. You guys don't have to stay for this whole process if you don't want. <laughs> So, probably, probably about two there. About now. But more than happy to keep asking questions, answering questions, and whatever. I hope you guys enjoy it so far. Oh, yes, yes, it was awesome. Yes. Cool. cool. Well, if nobody else has any questions or anything, I mean, feel free to hang out. Uh, the comedy started tonight at 9, right? Yes. A little so comedy show comedy. at 9. Uh, plenty of great beer on tap. They have bottles of, uh, of beer available. Uh, they're 12 bucks a bottle. Those are 11 bucks. Plus, you guys are getting 15% off with your membership. It's, it's 10. Plus, the homeless guy is. But, yeah, so, uh, if you guys have any other questions, I want to thank Charles again.